Good afternoon. I hope you are enjoying your afternoon food coma. <laughs> uh, they ran out of coffee. Perfect. So you guys are going to be a captive, captive audience here. You're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> uh, so welcome. We're going to talk about Network Intrusion Detection 101. And we're going to take a look at these two open source projects called OpenWRT and Open Canary. And we're going to kind of learn really low level uh, stuff uh, when it comes to routers, but really the hope here is to teach you how to set up some basic defenses for your home networks. Um, the motivation for why you would want to do something like that, I, for me this was a very personal project. I bring home a lot of smart devices. <laughs> I don't know about you, uh, it just keeps accumulating over the years. And I got to the point where uh, I have way too many of them, and there are certainly quite a few that I would not necessarily trust. So just as an exercise, like how many of you guys have smart devices at home, right? All right, everyone. How many would you consider like fully trusted? Like does everyone trust all of your IoT devices that you have on your network? I see zero hands. Perfect. If you are in the right, right talk then. Um, I don't trust most of my IoT devices, obviously, but then what can you do? <clears throat> really verifying them is impossible unless you have way too much time at your hand. And you dump the firmware and you load it up in Ghidra or something and you go through it uh, to analyze to see if there's any backdoors. But even if there is no backdoors, a lot of these devices are really cloud controlled, uh, which is awesome, right? Like this is very convenient. You have your phone and you are healthy across the world and you can turn on your thermostat. It's awesome um, on the one hand. On the other hand, this is clearly a network backdoor. Um, whoever has access to that cloud system or whatever cloud system your device talks to could control uh, that device and have access to your network that you actually have that device sitting on. So let's do a little bit of threat modeling of what uh, we will cover in this talk and what is the problem that we are trying to address. So obviously there is a elephant in the room is that you know hackers controlling your device. Uh, that happens uh, pretty much all the time. Um, you can read about it in you know, the New York Times that your nanny cam is talking to your kid and it's some guy from China. Um, obviously not great, uh, but that's sort of a little bit out of scope, right? This is not something that we can really address unless you do the hard work and you dump the firmware and you do the, your analysis. Um, but uh, I was thinking that you know, um, if you have this device on your home network um, and it started poking around on your home network, how would you know? So again, just a quick poll. Does any of you uh, run any type of intrusion detection at your, your home network? There's one, two, three. Wow, okay, that's probably 5% you know, of this crowd. It's probably way overrepresented to the average crowd, right? <laughs> um, but that's really what we want to uh, address here, is how can we actually figure out if some of these devices that might have been legitimate when you bought them, but then at some point, you know, the vendor, uh, who, who knows where it's coming from, what government has access to it, would, you know, try to like poke around your network. What can you do to detect that? So that's, that's really what's in scope. So what we need is a battle plan. And your battle plan does not need to be overly complex. Um, there is a fallacy in security that, you know, unless it has AI and a million different components, it's not, not real, it's not secure enough, you need a million bits of security. I disagree. I like things that are simple, and really the only two things you need is anticipate the next move of an attacker, and then deploy booby traps. Like booby traps are fantastic, right? Like uh, they work. <laughs> and really, what we are hoping to get here is really for the attacker to announce itself, and it's then it, they are on your network. So what we want to do is, you know, what what would you do if you were an attacker and you are just, you know, popped onto a network? Um, your next step would probably be to look around, you know, to run a port scan, you see what is on that network, and then find some juicy targets that you would try to connect to, maybe try some default passwords, but at least, you know, try to map out your environment, find, you know, what you might be looking for. So you kind of know what the attacker is going to do. So the booby traps would be um, fake services that you deploy on your network and log those connection attempts and Additionally, you don't just want to log it, because, well, who the hell looks at logs, right? That's not really uh, usable, but have something that actually emails you if something connects to one of those fake services, 
But then you can even build additional stuff on top of it. For example, uh, if anyone connects on your network, any, any device on your network connects to these fixed services, you can actually automatically program your home network to uh, try to slow them down. Try to, like, for example, kick the offending device off your Wi-Fi network, which is a defense, right? It will buy you time to actually identify which one of your devices is misbehaving and actually just unplug it. And this is what uh, this talk is about, uh, how to build that. So what we have in our tool bag is these two open source projects, uh, OpenWRT and OpenCanary. Uh, does anyone use either of these or have heard of them? Awesome. This is, a def this is definitely, I figured, the OpenWRT crowd, right? <laughs> okay, great. That's, that's what I see here. So Open Canary is a little known uh, open source tool. It uh, comes from the Tinks folks. Uh, they actually sell a commercial version of it, but the core of the project is open source. So I'm not affiliated with either of these projects. So I'm just, you know, your average Joe hacker who runs these things on their home network. But they're fantastic. So I've been running OpenWRT as my main uh, router OS for over a decade. Uh, I used DDWRT before, but I find OpenWRT to just be way more solid and it's you know, open source uh, and uh, millions, well not millions, but hundreds of thousands of devices probably can run open WRT. Uh, your home uh, router probably supports it. So you can look up you know, which devices are supported by open WRT. You download the image, flash it on your router, and now you have a easily customizable router OS with really a uh, thousands of packages that you can install uh, to extend its base functionality. Now, Open Canary, it's a framework that's written in Python, and it's an open source honeypot system, and it has a ton of features. It's really great. Uh, it can mimic itself to be a NAS, Telnet, SSH, HTTP, MySQL, Git, uh, really has a wonderful array of fake services that it supports. And when you connect to them, they look real, right? So you can actually uh, try to interact with these services and first look at, they would look like they are real services. So it's really kind of hard to tell whether you are interacting with a real server or not. So we kind of want to put these two things together. And the reason why I want to do that is, um, obviously you could put Open Canary on like a Raspberry Pi and just you know, put one service on it in your network. But that's sort of uh, ineffic inefficient. I hate having you know, just a another device on my network that now I have to maintain. Um, it would be way better to integrate these two and just have my router run the honeypots for me. And it also allows to do some neat network tricks that will uh, allow us to actually extend the base uh, functionality of Open Canary. So this is my actual router. Uh, this is what I run at home. Uh, this is a Banana Pi R3. This is a Wi-Fi dev board, but really, again, you can look at your router and see if it supports OpenWRT. You can run it on it. Uh, so this one is really uh, a beast. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty crazy how powerful routers are these days, but this one has like two gigs of RAM and four CPUs, and like this could definitely run Doom. Uh, <laughs> um, and I run a ton of different services on it. So I run you know, DNS over HTTPS, QoS, VPN, uh, it's my NAS, this is, this is my home server. Right? This is not just a router anymore, this is like a server on itself. And what's crazy is that you can actually run Docker on this thing. Like, you run Docker containers on your router. Like, this is crazy. Like, but how awesome is that? <laughs> and uh, if you never used, I mean, this crowd definitely has used. Most of you guys have used OpenWRT, so you know what it looks like. You get, like, a web interface for it, that you can interact with it. Um, but to set it up as a Docker host, you kind of want to go and connect to it through SSH. Uh, the web UI is fine, but when you're pulling in larger Docker images, the web UI is a little clunky. So uh, to begin with, uh, actually connecting to the, to the router through SSH is really uh, just more convenient, but it's pretty straightforward. You run these four commands where you SSH in, you update your package list, and then you install Docker, the Docker Compose and Lucy app Dockerman which will add an extension to the web UI to actually configure Docker images. And then, finally, you pull in this uh, Docker image that thinks actually uh, distributes for Open Canary, and you pretty much have the base honeypot system on your router. To actually create a container of it, you go into the Docker configuration. Um, 
on the router itself. Now this is all on the web UI for the router. So this is, you know, you don't have to poke around for this part uh, in the uh, config files. If you are adventurous, of course, these are all backed by just regular Linux config files. On OpenWRT, you can edit them directly, but it's just more convenient through the web UI. I like to set my Docker root to be an external device where I actually have more space. So you can just plug in a USB device to your router and now you have gigabytes of space. And then you just click on add a container. You pick the image for things, uh, open canary. And you, at the bottom there, you mount a single folder uh, for that Docker container to be shared with the host. This is where you actually will send the configuration file to this honeypot system where you uh, tell which services you actually want to have that Docker image serve you. This is what that configuration file looks like for Open Canary. It's really just a JSON file that details the type of services you want this uh, Docker container to serve, this Canary to serve, and this is an example that serves an FTP honeypot. Uh, but as I said, it has a long list of different services. So just for you know fitting on this screen, I just pick the single service, you can literally configure dozens of different services here equally simply. You just say, you know, mysql.enable true, and now you have a mysql uh, service being faked on your, on your network. Um, you click on start, and there you go. Now that you have that Docker container in your network, the only thing you have to do now is really map from your main network to that Docker network, right? So the Docker container runs on an internal Docker uh, network. And that helps uh, from security perspective to add a layer of defense in depth, right? So your honeypot itself is not running on your main network. So even if there is a bug, let's say in Open Canary, it will run in a separate network. So if someone breaks into that, it will be in a, a separate network. So you have to set up a port forward between your main network to this, to this honeypot, which is, again, pretty simple. You go to firewall, click on add, and you pick port 21, and you say that you know, the source zone is your LAN, and the destination zone is Docker, and you put in the Docker container's IP. And now anyone who tries to connect to your router on port 21 will actually get redirected to this honeypot service. All right, so here's an example of it. I try to connect to the router. It says, you know, sorry, authentication failed. And I get this line in the bottom of a very noisy log message under five clicks away from the main web UI. So cool, right? <laughs> Not particularly useful at this point. But at least this shows that, hey, this service is up on the network. You can connect to it, and it has, you know, it gets locked. Obviously, this is not usable at this point because who the hell would actually spend their time watching this log? So this is where you actually want to go in and make this a lot more usable. Uh, a very simple way to do that is really to just add email alerts. So uh, Open Canary has a uh, logging system where you can actually go in and uh, configure an SMTP logger. You just you know, specify what is the SMTP server address, your credentials, uh, and how do you want to email those logs. So you just say, you know, subject open canary alert, and that's it. Uh, if I get anything connected to it, I get this JSON message emailed to me, but honestly, I don't care that it's not pretty. Uh, only thing I care is that it will appear in a place that I regularly check, right? I no longer have to like log into my router and click around to find, you know, which tab contains the logs. It just goes into my mailbox. If anything happens, perfect, real-time alerting, it's enabled, I can forget about it. That's, that's really the beauty of this defense system is that you set it up once and you don't have to main constantly check, worry about it, it's passive. It just sits there and waits for an attacker to announce itself. So what can we do to make this even, even better, right? Uh, how about more canaries? As I said, we can run a ton of different services. But from an attacker's perspective, if I run a port scan and I see that my router is running MySQL and it's running uh, VNC and Git, I might get suspicious that something is funky with that router. Like, uh, um, I might not try to connect to that, right? So we need to be you know, anticipating, again, the way an attacker might think. So how about we deploy these services not on the router's IP, but we just 
make up fake IPs on the network that will respond and will serve these fake services. Um, by default, the way you do that in OpenWRT is you just go to the interfaces tab and you can just add another IP to the network, network interface, right? And that network interface will re respond on that IP. You just, you know, type in that secondary IP slash 32 and now that interface responds with that IP as well. Um, that route, unfortunately, is not great because that would also mean that the regular services that your router offers like SSH and this web interface would also appear on those secondary IPs. So if I'm an attacker and I see that, hey, the same ports are open on all of these random IPs on the network, I might again get suspicious that, hey, why is, you know, everything serves the same web interface. So, um, so not, not, not the best one. And also the MAC address would show up as the same for these IPs. So uh, we need to do something, something different here. Solution for that that I found is that, again, OpenWRT has a ton of really cool extensions, and one of them is called kmod-macvlan. So it's a kernel module that really allows you to create additional devices uh, on your router uh, that will respond to other MAC addresses. So the way you do that is you install this package, obviously. Then under the Network Devices tab, you can just add another device, you pick the device type to be, to be this MAC VLAN, and you just give it a different MAC address. Then you go back to the interfaces one, and you set a static address for it with, again, slash 32 to be specified so that it's not trying to route anything there, just that one particular IP. And you put it on the firewall zone for LAN, and uh, the external IP uh, you set for the firewall port to be that IP that you set. And now, your FTPs, this FTP uh, service will respond on that secondary IP. And even if you look at the ARP setting for it, it will be a different MAC address than what the main router is. So at this point, if you are on the network and you run a port scan, this port will pop up and this IP will pop up, uh, but you will not be able to tell that, hey, this is actually just the router serving some fake service on this IP address on the network. So from an attacker's perspective, this just might look like a real FTP server on the network. Uh, and you can do this for all the different services that Open Canary offers. So you can have a separate IP with a VNC server, a separate IP with Git, a separate IP for all of these different services. And an attacker would have no idea which one of those are, is real and which one is fake. So you're already you know, making an attacker's life uh, harder because uh, it will be more likely that they will announce themselves. Anytime anyone connects to any of these fake services, you will get an email alert. Um, but uh, we can even do better than that, right? So we can actually take um, automated action. Um, as I said, one of the idea here was to, you know, it's nice if we can get the logs. Uh, that way we can actually figure out which one of our devices is mal malfunctioning. But how can we actually uh, get, it, get those devices off the Wi-Fi, right? So we already know that, hey, this device is malfunctioning. It's connecting to fake services. I'm not at home. I don't have time to like, you know, go and unplug all my devices manually until I figure out which one was you know, connecting to my service. So why not just shut them down, kick them off the network? Uh, that will uh, buy some time. It's not a perfect solution um, because um, for that device to be able to connect to your Wi-Fi, it already knows the Wi-Fi password. So really, if they switch out their MAC address with what they connect to the network with, they can still reconnect afterwards. But unless the attacker is anticipating that type of uh, defenses, um, they might have just lost access to that device, right? So if it's cloud controlled and you log into that device remotely, start poking around, and now the Wi-Fi kicks you off, you're probably logged out of that device. So your network is, is safe. So it buys you some time. It's not perfect. If you have really a dedicated attacker, he can still reconnect to your Wi-Fi, but uh, you will see that in your logs, at least. So the way you, we can really do this is to integrate Open Canary with OpenWRT. And the nice thing is that Open Canary offers this ability to uh, issue webhooks. So the same way that it can send uh, alerts through email, uh, it can actually connect to Teams and Slack as well to send you chat messages, but it can also integrate with any service you have that supports you know, a REST API. 
uh, so we can issue webhooks. And I started looking, you know, whether OpenWRT has anything like that. You know, how, how can I, you know, automatically program OpenWRT? And it looks like they actually have a subsystem for it called UBUS, and that is exposed uh, through a REST API called RPCD that you can actually uh, programmatically connect to OpenWRT to, uh, to do different things. And in fact, you can just add services to OpenWRT really quite simply by putting a script under this folder in user libexec rpcd, and I just add a service here, here that's open canary. And this is literally just a bash script, and that will show up as a REST API endpoint that uh, open canary can call into. Only requirement for this service is to respond to the list and the call um, commands in, in the first argument, but then you can really program it to do whatever. So we're gonna make this service available, but by default, the uh, RPC interface on OpenWRT requires authentication. OpenWRT is great in that sense because, well, you shouldn't just have you know, RPC uh, APIs without authentication. Unfortunately, the way it works is that with OpenWRT, you first have to authenticate yourself, and you get a token back, and then you can use that token to call the other Open, uh, OpenWRT uh, services. Open Canary, on the other hand, just sends you a single webhook. So there is a you know, uh, discrepancy there. Obviously, Open Canary is open source. You could always just go in and patch in so that it does this authentication better. But I was lazy. Uh, you can uh, work around it by actually doing a custom authentication scheme. Obviously, a better solution would be to make Open Canary more integrated with OpenWRT. But uh, the solution I got working so far was done in 30 minutes and it works okay. So what we do is we actually make this service uh, accessible with uh, no authentication. So you add this configuration to the ACL for OpenWRT that just says, hey, this RPC uh, interface is going to be open for everyone. But then we have a custom authentication added to it where this shell script that is actually gets called on the end just has something that you define manually that's an alt token. You can put anything in here, right? So it says specify a Unix string here, really just replace that with anything. So when someone calls into this API, they need to send this magic token with their API call, and if it doesn't match what's baked in, then it will be rejected. So that's what, that's what happens here. If anyone calls this uh, interface with the add command, they actually have to specify two uh, different fields, one is called the magic, and the second one is the message, and if the magic doesn't match this alt token, then calls to it are rejected, so uh, it's <laughs> not the most sophisticated authentication scheme, but for my home network, this was done in 30 minutes, it works fine. Again, better integration is possible, uh, put it on the to-do list. Now, what's left of this service to actually function is look at that message that Open Canary sends, right? So that's the message part, and that's really just a JSON uh, blob that we saw in the email as well. We're just gonna have to parse it out. And what's logged in there is the IP that was actually connecting to the fake service. So now we have to take this IP address and translate it back into a MAC address, because really on your, on your local network, devices talk to each other using the MAC address. And this is the interface, uh, this is the way that we can actually drop devices from, from the Wi-Fi as well. Uh, so there is a feature on the Wi-Fi uh, settings for OpenWRT where you can specify a MAC blacklist. So you can list all of those MAC addresses that you will not allow connecting to your network even if it has the password. So we just automatically look up the MAC address from the IP, add it to the MAC blacklist for all of the Wi-Fi interfaces, then reset the Wi-Fi now everyone has to reconnect, and that one device that was offending, uh, the connecting to the fake service is now no longer allowed back. So we just bought, ourso bought ourselves some time. The last piece to get this working is to add the configuration to the Open Canary config side. Um, really, uh, that thing that's uh, highlighted there is where you would put this magic alt token. All of those 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0s that you see in there, that would be the actual uh, token that OpenWRT gave you if you authenticated properly. Uh, obviously, we are not, but it works. And then you just specify that, hey, this content type that this webhook is sending is JSON. 
And there we go. We have a system where you can deploy a ton of different services on real looking IPs around your network, different MAC addresses. Uh, it will email alert you and will also kick off offending devices from, from your network. So in terms of you know, setup time, if you already have OpenWRT working on your router, I would say you can get this working in an hour or two. So this is very uh, simple to do, uh, no maintenance required, no false positives really, because unless you have some really buggy devices, but you probably want to know which one those are, and you can just forget about it, right? So this is a level of uh, security that you can have on your home network for free, uh, and you can rest sleep easy at night knowing that your devices are not misbehaving. I know that keeps me up at night. So a <laughs> so, um, couple other things that we can do is, for example, you know, we could also look at port scans. And if any device on the network just start port scanning, we could also drop them at that moment. Open Canary actually has a uh, port scan detector as well. So we could even you know, prevent them from discovering the services. But on the other hand, I'm kind of curious at that point, right? I already have this working on my network. I kind of want to know what they would connect to. Like, I'm just curious. Like, if I have an attacker on my network, what would they go after? So why not let them? So I, I actually don't enable the port scan on my home network. I kind of want to know what they are doing, right? Like, maybe they are going after the FTP. Maybe MySQL. Who knows? Like, why would they pick the service they picked? So I, it's up to you. Um, another thing that would be nice is heartbeat check. I had on occasion the honeypot go offline, and then uh, you don't actually uh, get an alert of that. So you know, so having some heartbeat check would be nice, and also again having you know this configuration be a little bit more user friendly. So creating a web UI for uh, creating that Open Canary configuration would be nice. It should be pretty straightforward. I just haven't really got there. Um, creating a dashboard for the honeypot activity uh, would be interesting. And you can also extrapolate from you know, this, this attack. So you can you know, tweak it a little bit. So one idea that uh, uh, my colleague mentioned that would be interesting is what if uh, instead of just you know, sprinkling these services randomly around your network, you actually just make all of the IPs on your network respond by some fake service that you're not actually using for something. Like how cool would that be? It's like, yeah, an attacker, like that would be a major pain to work around. It's like, oh my God, this network is full. Like, what do I do, <laughs> what do, I do now? Um, yeah, so that would be cool. Uh, have to figure out, you know, when you uh, actually use an IP, so you have to like configure it with the, D D coordinate with the DHCP on the system, but it could totally be done. Uh, so that, that goes on the to-do list, so that would be fun to have. Um, you know, what if we actually wanted to like expose this honeypot to not just the internal network, but for the external one, right? That could be also interesting. Like who is trying to like connect to your network from outside? I'm less interested in that simply because there's already a ton of people collecting that information and I don't want to necessarily overload my router with that information, but you know, uh, you could totally do that. And then the third, uh, uh, the final idea is, you know, combining this with honey tokens. So. Honey tokens are very similar in idea to honeypots, but instead of providing a service, you provide credentials uh, that an attacker can discover on your network. So let's say you have a disk, uh, network attached disk somewhere or your server, and you, f you leave around fake credentials, you know, an AWS account, uh, email account, or something like that. And if anyone tries to use those credentials to log into those services, you actually get an alert. So they are similar in idea, they are just not service oriented, but data oriented. So maybe, you know, we can create these fake services to serve some fake data, um, hook it up so that the alerts are going to the same, uh, same pipeline. For example, that would be interesting. Things also offers like honey tokens for free, so I, I highly check, uh, recommend checking that out. Integrating that with this logging mechanism with OpenWRT is something that I still, still on the to-do list. So yes, uh, question? Another to do would be nice if the attacker goes back and, and reverse access. <laughs> Automatically, right? <laughs> uh, it goes into a bit of an ethical dilemma there, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, first step comes first. Um, so in summary, 
honeypots, I think, add a layer of protection to your home network that's really low to medium. You can go overboard and you know, do as many you know, trip fires on your home network you want, but you know, just having set up a couple of fake services and FTP here, SSH there, I think that's already pretty simple to do and uh, sh everyone should do it, especially if you are running OpenWRT at home now. There is no reason not to. Uh, so I wrote up a documentation for it. Uh, you can find it on the OpenWRT wiki already. So that's uh, that long link in the middle. And just want to you know, give a shout out to all the folks behind OpenWRT and Open Canary for making such awesome open source software that you can really hack and extend. Uh, question? Um, it does not have a tarpid option right now, but that's also a uh, really great technique where you actually keep connections open for an attacker to interact with. And the idea is that, well, every connection that they, you keep alive, that attacker has one less port to use for attacking others. Um, right now, I'm, I don't think Open Canary has one, but uh, it's pretty easily extendable, so it can be put together as well, and it's open source. Um, and a final shout out, if you are interested in this type of you know, honeypot uh, informations and projects, definitely uh, the HoneyNet project is a great place to start looking at that. So I've been participating in the HoneyNet project for over 10 years. There's a ton of different honeypots and uh, digital forensics and malware uh, analysis tools that the HoneyNet project builds. It's all open source. Uh, so you know, check that out as well. And if you have questions, please ping me and uh, this was really my talk, so if you guys have more questions, I'm happy to address. So, one, two, three, okay. Uh, first, you again. <laughs> There is no centralized place that I'm aware of that collects this type of information. It would be great, right? Like before I buy my next device, like, hey, has anyone logged this device to be poking around on my home network? Hey, there you go. There's a service idea that someone can put together for sure. Uh, cool, good idea uh, to do. <laughs> uh, hold on, there are more questions down there and then we can come to you. Yes. Yes. Zero. So all my devices are good so far. <laughs> I was hoping someone will ask that. Uh, unfortunately, no, not yet. So, but um, you know, it's running, it's waiting. Maybe one day. <laughs> uh, there was one more question there. I did self-testing. Yes, I did. Yeah, I did self-test. The system works, so I got those alerts. But then it kicked my laptop off the Wi-Fi, and I had to go in and unblock myself and you know plug myself in with a wire. So. <laughs> um, so there was one question here, and then we can go back there. Um, with um, Packet that you had, uh, Mac VLAN? Mac VLAN, yeah. Um, is that only for open source, or um, can you install it on a regular Linux? Um, so OpenWRT you can install really on, on most devices. So I tested on Raspberry Pis, it runs on x86, and then this Mac VLAN does not require a physical device at all. So it, it, run, it runs as an extension on top of your Ethernet device. So you just need an Ethernet device. So, so this is, is this packet uh, hosted by OpenWRT? Correct. Is it also available in that? I have no idea. And honestly, like I don't really know what it does because it also does something called VIPA, which is Virtual Ethernet Port Aggregate. I have actually no idea what that is for. So there you, there you go. I'm happy to see more people <laughs> familiar with these texts. Honestly, I, I've never seen this before. I just was poking around to hope to find something that works, and this was the first thing I tried, and it worked. So um, yeah, there we go. VPN stuff. Do you have a question back there? Yes. Yes. Right, so in this place I'm running the Docker container, but you could also put the entire OpenWRT itself into a VM and you run it that way. I like to have it on the router itself because then you can do these networking tricks. Um, if you have it as not your, your main I, you know, gateway, 
I'm not sure if those networking tricks would work the same way. It might, right? It might be that the device still responds to those MAC addresses. It's something to try. I haven't tried that, but yeah, you can deploy this really on uh, many, many different devices. So it's pretty fantastically adaptable. So. Yes. 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 So there, there is uh, not for this particular one, right? So this was specifically for OpenWRT, but there are honeypots that are designed for cloud native ones. So, for example, check out Teapot. That's a uh, has cloud native uh, sides to it, uh, and it has a bunch of different honeypots that it supports. And also, the Things Canary is something to check out. You know, that's a commercial version of the Open Canary. And they do support a bunch of different enterprise environments. So if you're looking to deploy honeypots in, in uh, enterprise settings, I definitely would uh, start there. Um, I do think you know this type of passive security uh, tools are way underutilized in, in our tool bag. Like, and they shouldn't be. They are really fantastically simple, and they really complicate an attacker's life. So not just on your home network, but you could do this yeah, on, on enterprise networks for sure. I did set up some network monitoring tools like that, and then I just never looked at the logs. Like. <laughs> Uh, that's usually the problem with most of these security stuff is that it requires active monitoring and you have to remember to check and then you forget and then you're like, oh, whatever, something might have already happened and I just didn't know. Um, so no, I, I don't do that stuff at my home network simply because the overhead is way too much and uh, I prefer you know, just passive, passive stuff that will alert me when something trips. And for, for active monitoring, you will have to deal with yeah, log monitoring, false positives, and that's, yeah. There's only, only so much time in the world that you have, right? So. Uh, I don't know the specs on that, but you know the router that I'm using is pretty cheap. It was hundred something bucks on Amazon, and that was way more powerful than I actually need. Uh, so I would ex expect if OpenWRT builds a router, it will be kick-ass. So I'm, I expect that it will be able to run this. So again, the memory overhead of this is, is that of running a Docker container. So it's like a couple hundred megs of uh, stuff you have to have loaded, but other than that, it's, it's pretty light. So I would expect it to just work on that too. So any other questions? Uh, Rowan, you had a question, I think. It was already answered? <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming to the talk. Uh, again, check out, you know, all the the goodness. Oh, we lost the, the slide. You know, check out the HoneyNet project. Check out the wiki. Hope that uh, you guys will use this. Thank you.